Hi, everybody. It's been a long time, uh, and oof, there's kind of a lot to to talk about and to cover. Uh, so much so that I had to write it all down <laughs> um, because that's the kind of uh, person I am. So you'll excuse me if I if I refer to this Google Doc. Um, and I've literally been working on this Google Doc for over a month because <laughs> uh, yeah, there's there's a lot. Um, yeah, the school year just started. Uh, John Doom asks on Twitch, um, school year just started. Everybody seems to be going well. I'm not attending. I, I work at a school. So, um, yeah, but I'll talk a little bit about that in, in the future. But now I just want to welcome you all in. Uh, <laughs> hey, DJ. A little roomy echoey. Okay. Um, oh, let me double check that I'm using the right, yeah, it should be, okay, yeah. Yes, um, awesome, very, all, yeah, it's, uh, it's fun, I, I really enjoy this. Like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a second, but, um, it's, it's a good gig, it's a good gig. Um. Yeah, I, uh, so I'm actually streaming this from work. I was going to do it in the nice studio that we have, but um, it's not really a one-man studio uh, at this stage, so it's a little difficult to set up. Um, and uh, um, I didn't want to go all the way home and do it all over again and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to stop pretzel. Uh, there we go. And uh, yeah, so so I'm doing this um uh at at work but uh yeah this is my this is my office you have no idea how large it is but it's okay <laughs> i have a window that's all that matters um all right i don't want to necessarily belabor the point and i want to open this up for q a to um I'm, i think that there's going to be a lot of questions and concerns and thoughts and all of that stuff, uh, you know, I can do this um, so much in my own head. Uh, I can work through budgets and schedules and communication and marketing and all of that stuff. I can do it all in my own head, but ultimately uh, it, it needs to be spoken out loud and people need to hear it and then and, uh, as a way of understanding it. But I realize I'm totally just, you know, skipping the point now. So I'm just going to begin. So hello, explorers. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, you've likely noticed, or maybe you didn't, that our content has been, well, non non-existent of late. Uh, there are some big reasons for that. So let's get started with the state of the throw. And to be clear, I do say our content because while I'm doing a lot of the sweat equity, you and your views uh, and your subscriptions and your tips have literally kept the lights on and kept production flowing for the last eight years. So you may hear me shift out of the first person singular and into the first person plural. Sorry, but you are part of the team now. And as such, you need to hear what's going on. So time. Being exhausted is not something that I casually admit to. Uh, as a producer, I am usually the number one cheerleader for a project. And personally, to me, that means staying positive and always looking at the big picture. Uh, I've been pushing content for a long time and have been running this channel nonstop since 2014. Really since 2013, but but 2014 is when we, we really started. Uh, with income collapsing, likely due to COVID and some other factors, I had to take a day job to make ends meet. And then life changes precipitated a move out of Los Angeles to Utah uh, and to a new job and a new environment. I very much love my current job, but 
it has made anything that I do with saving throw require a much higher personal investment. And I always said, if I am to spend any time on saving throw, it has to be worth it. Uh, I've been extremely lucky to have worked with some of the best in the business and on some truly incredible shows using some amazing games. And I have a billion more ideas and people that I want to support through the channel, but current resources and revenue are making that incredibly difficult. The content I produce on Saving Throw deserves an audience, and uh, I have worked hard to make sure an audience can find and enjoy it. But the last few years have seen a steady decline in that audience, and I'll get to my theories why a little bit later. Um, I realize this kind of sounds like an apology video, like I screwed something up or whatever, but I, I don't think so. I don't think I did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, anyway, it, I'm sure it will sound like an apology video, but whatever. That I'm not apologizing for anything unless I did something wrong. Uh, I work really hard um, to get shows off the ground. I uh, am literally, literally the only one building pitch decks, designing logos, overlays, our social media. I'm reaching out to all manner of sponsors to build some revenue potential. And for most content, I run all of the tech and occasionally I GM too. Um, I do any editing needed on videos and podcasts. I create intros and not to mention I write many of the one page adventures and do all of the procurement design and shipping of our backer merch. Uh, it's honestly several full-time jobs that I've managed to fit into one unpaid part-time gig. In short, uh, with a day job, a home life that I really want to be present for, the state of social media marketing in the TTRPG space, don't get me started, and the two biggest key factors of resources and revenue uh, not being what they could be, it's become increasingly difficult to devote the time I used to to save and throw. I'd like to say that I have a viable solution to this, but um, I don't. <laughs> Uh, I do have some ideas, which I'll get to later on, um, but for now, I kind of want to uh, talk specifics, if you'll indulge me. Uh, so I, I mentioned resources and revenue. When I say resources, I'm talking about a few things. Uh, revenue, audience, marketing, and players and GMs. Those are all the resources that uh, kind of make up what Saving Throw is capable of doing. Uh, revenue deserves its own section, so I will cover that in a little bit, but just know that almost all of the resources I mentioned have an effect on revenue. Uh, I'll start off with the audience. Uh, what's become, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'm just, I, so this is gonna, I, I really, what I really don't want to do is have this come across as a, um, uh, uh, uh I don't know, excuse video. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to lay blame or make excuses or anything like that. I'm just, I'm just telling it the way that I see it. There are a multitude of reasons, but these are the things that I'm seeing. So take it with a grain of salt, but um, here's, here's what I see. Uh, What's become more and more apparent is that as bigger studios produce RPG content, smaller groups like ours are getting pushed out simply because there isn't enough time in the day, week, month, whatever, for an audience to consume all of this content. Uh, and generally, the wider TTRPG audience is focused on maybe three or four of these large streams or podcasts, maximum. Uh, and they effectively serve as blinders to the rest of the community, unless there's an audience that is specifically looking for a certain game. Uh, but to cut to the chase, uh, a Twitter feed with a following of 100,000 is going to get their shows in front of more eyes than ours ever could. We, we have a, tw uh, a Twitter um, audience of less than 8,000. Um, good by any means, but but tiny uh, compared to others. A Twitch audience base of 50,000 plus, meaning people who follow or subscribe to um, 
a Twitch channel in the in the fifty plus fifty thousand plus uh, will inevitably have more people watching than one like us, which we hover around eighteen thousand. Without some way to get eyeballs uh, onto our content instead of other content, we're facing a losing battle. That's the nature of streamed RPG content. It's the nature of streaming. Um, because, But especially RPG content, because of its length, it, it has an extremely steep barrier of entry. And, and I don't like this conflict in the system. I don't like that we have to compete with view, for views with other channels. But... Um, RPGs are not necessarily meant to be played in 30-minute chunks. Um, I'll get into editing a little bit. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, the Holocaust cloak. <laughs> I did forget to mention that. Oh, I am the Brute Squad. Um, so, yeah, I don't like the conflict, but it exists. All right. Where this, problem, where this becomes a problem... Uh, is many audiences say that they don't like those top four choices. And when I, when I say uh, many audiences, I'm, I'm really talking about people who don't normally watch streamed RPGs. Um, because they, first of all, they really only know of four or five streamers, YouTubers, podcasters that do RPGs. Those are the ones that are in their orbit uh and they have a predisposition to not like them <laughs> uh but there's nothing really promoting smaller streams that do cater to what these audiences might want to see uh so discovery is nearly impossible in the past i've tried to combat this by producing alternative content non d d shows specifically and ones with you know uh stellar cast members and amazing stories extraordinary gms telling stories that that break from the d d fantasy trope uh, like new pantheon wild cards tinting fate uh and if we did do a d d show uh it was backed not only by incredible talent uh, but talent that was doing new things with the RPG, uh, like Iron Keep Chronicles and Pirates of Salt Bay. Uh, and while some of those shows saw some minor success in pockets of the industry, um, we were never able to uh, convert that success into a sustaining um, and growth audience model. Uh, bottom line, we couldn't capture enough of an audience to keep shows afloat on their own. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, to answer DJ regular, yeah, it's it's really hard. Um, it's really hard to, talk, to, to get that conversation going on social media about what you like. Um, it, I don't know, there's, there's just a weird um, block um, and and uh, a overall sense of toxic positivity that's really hard to kind of um, uh, overcome. But I'll, I don't know. We'll talk about, about that later, maybe. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't say any of this um, to discourage you from watching or viewing content that's not saving throw. Uh, I, I, if you watch other stuff, I don't think that you're a traitor to the channel or anything like that. You watch what you want to watch, more power to you. And I do appreciate that bigger streams are slowly getting more diverse uh, and using more diverse players and systems uh, on their shows because it's, it's a fantastic opportunity for friends of mine. Um, and it's not their fault or their problem. So I just want to make that clear. Um, I can hear the refrain, uh, in the back, <laughs> in the far back. Uh, if you make good content, your audience will find you, uh, which is great and generally true. Uh, but growing that audience is tough if people aren't sharing or talking about it. Getting our own performers to promote a game they star in and are getting paid for 
was a mountain to climb on its own. Most often they would just retweet our going live post, which at that point, no one knew was going to come in. Um, so if our own paid performers aren't tweeting about this, how are we to grow the, the, the audience, right? Um, so that takes me into marketing. Um, d d not only has the largest share of streamed content by far, they also dominate the conversation on social media. There are very few feeds that are sustained around, say, Savage Worlds or Pathfinder uh, in the greater social media scene. Forums for those games are indeed very lively, but that's a very specific audience. There's no movie being made about those systems that I know of. Uh, there aren't popular Netflix shows showcasing them or anything like that. Even people who do talk about non-D&D systems on social media tend to talk about them in comparison to D&D because that's the largest point of reference for the majority of the audience. So there's a massive struggle to promote systems and shows that cannot be explained to the general public without invoking D&D. Uh, thank you, Sun King, for watching Salt Bays. I appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, um, you can't really get out of D&D's shadow, it seems like. Um, additionally, smaller RPG publishers and creators are tough to produce content for because there is rarely a large built-in audience for them. And those companies or individuals in many cases just don't have the revenue themselves to support shows like ours. Um, and I don't say this to minimize fans of those systems, but the overall market share of these uh, systems is tiny compared to D&D. And thus the number of people in that audience who also watch RPGs, minuscule. Whereas the majority of D&D's current audience grew up with it as a streamed game experience. Um, that's something I think not a lot of people take into account. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but it's become a spectator sport almost as much as it's become a tabletop game. And I don't really, um, to be fair, I, I, I've certainly, um, I, I, I've certainly uh, contributed to the to the spectator sportedness of RPGs. Uh, I, I am I am complicit in that, and I think it's it's really cool. Um, but um, it's hard to um, when there are only four or five big streams, and they're all D and D streams. Uh, it's hard to say, hey, we're all, we, you know, we do another show, different RPG system, and uh, we do all these cool things with it. Um, it just doesn't quite break. Um, you know, it, it's, we're too small <laughs> to, to, uh, to even be recognized as innovators. Um, even if we were the first ones to do a lot of things, uh, I won't even say that we were, but um, let's say that we did. <laughs> because our we don't have the 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 audience reach as say a critical role. This is not to disparage critical role; they're amazing people. Um, but um, if critical role does it, even years after we do it, they're generally going to be. Um, claimed as the innovators or the creators of um, the whole thing. Uh, indeed, when you <laughs> see people talking about streamed RPGs, they generally start at critical role. Um, they don't even mention like um, uh, Acquisitions Incorporated or ITMEJP who were doing streamed broadcasted RPGs D&D long before Critical Role was. Um, but still, because they were the biggest um, and created the phenomenon, really, um, uh, the, the credit kind of goes to them. I, I'm not saying that's good or bad, but I'm, I'm just saying that it's hard to, 
to step out of that. So we've got two kind of major shadows kind of um, covering the marketing. Um, and honestly, the, in, the industry is at a stage where there is a glut of content on the market. The prevalence of Twitch in the zeitgeist and the equity of technology means that nearly anyone with a cell phone or laptop can broadcast their ideas to the world. And, and that's awesome. I really think that that's very cool. Um, it, and it's truly a marvel of communication and entertainment. But it seems if you don't have thousands of fans and are continually growing that number by a few hundred every month, it's easy to get lost in the audience shuffle from week to week. Um, I'm catching up on your on yours uh, on your posts here. Oh, thank you, Theria Tan. I hope I pronounced that right. There, there are there are a few Warhammer 40k RPGs, but uh, I don't know if they're any good. But yeah. <laughs> That's true, voice games. Um, thank you, America. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. So, so marketing is is, and I, this is we've hired um, P, a PR firm. We hired a PR firm for a few months to try to jumpstart and get the conversation going. And um, while they did help us kind of work out some intricacies of, you know, when to post and, and how often to post and stuff like that, they honestly looked at us and said, you're too small for us to do anything with. So despite the fact that we had really cool stories to tell, that we were doing things that other streamers were not doing, um, there just wasn't anything in it for them to uh, push it to, you know, an aggregator, uh, like a, a polygon or, um, I don't know, a, other uh, a dice breaker or, or, or other, is dice breaker polygon? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> other groups that um, um, report on RPGs. And so sometimes we get a passing mention in those things, but, you know, rarely would we ever get a, you know, hey, this, this company or this group is starting a new, you know, RPG stream and it features diverse performers and uh, an in inclusive world and amazing engagement. We just, we couldn't get past an email. Um, so it's tough. Uh, performers. Then this is I I I preface this. This is going to sound really gripey. I think, in a in a bit. And honestly, I've just sort of reached a level of frustration that I just need to get it off my chest. Um, and my girlfriend is tired of hearing it from me, so I I have to <laughs> I have to tell you all. Um, yes, this is yes entirely DJ regular uh, folks. Um, it, with Critical Role, D20, etc., they have they all individually have huge fan bases um, themselves, and so bringing that in. But I'm going to get to that in a second, actually, because it's interesting. So uh, I've cast folks um, with a paying gig via a sponsor, only to have them back out hours, sometimes minutes before we go live due to personal emergencies only to see them the next day lament on social media how they wish someone would ask them to be on an RPG. It is maddening and absolutely destroys my self-esteem every damn time. Um, not only does it hurt the other players, especially the GM who now has to scramble to make up for a lost player, it hurts me because I promise sponsors and you as an audience who will be on the show a lot of the audience is predicated on on who's coming. They want to see people, right? You want to see people. And perhaps shame on me for trusting individuals to fulfill their duties and not require a contract. 
But I've also had people shun a contract when I've presented it to them because they don't like the pressure it puts on them. I can't, I can't win, honestly. Um, uh, I, I mean, I've tried both ways and um, it, it, it's, it's just extremely frustrating. All this to say, I've had a really rough go of it with performers. Um, especially now that we're a remote production house and we have no studio, people seem to have uh, less respect for what we're working towards. Um, they, I get more people calling out. Um, they need a mental health day. They need, you know, um, oh, they promised that they were, you know, someone in their other group was going to stream something and then they backed out. So now they have to stream something. So, Continually saving throw was getting, you know, even if, even though we were paying, um, they would say, no, I've got something better to do. Um, that's hard. That's hard just personally, because it, it, to me, it feels, it feels like a personal attack. Uh, you know, like people just don't value what I'm working on. Um, certainly, unfortunately, not everyone I work with is like this. And I can count on both hands the number of people who have stiffed me like this. Um, but navigating players who are committed, entertaining, and just solid in the industry is absolute chaos. And oftentimes the players who generate the most audience turnout are also the most problematic from a production standpoint. Uh, many times over the years, I've said no to big names. Um, I mean, we're not talking like Hollywood big, but we're talking RPG famous people. Um, and I would say no because I knew that they would cause chaos internally. Even if I knew people would come to watch them because they had a built-in audience, um, I prioritized the health of the table over the audience, over what I thought we could get um, with an audience because I knew if the other players began to rebel because of a toxic player, I wouldn't have a show. Unfortunately, many of those same colleagues not only continually cast some of these people uh, or work with them, but th uh, my some of my producer colleagues will put many toxic individuals together in one show. Uh, and you get the same 10 or 15 people over and over and over again for RPG streams because of this. Um, and that is super frustrating. Um, there, there are, there are a number of people who, um, who came close to being on saving throw. And I got a lot of people saying, oh, we should bring them on because everybody knows who they are. And, you know, they're, they're big in the, in D and D, you know, Wizards of the Coast loves them or whatever. Um, and, uh, it's not worth it. <laughs> it's not worth, it's not worth going back. And if you've watched these Twitter, um, explosions of people who, uh, were beloved members of, of the industry. And then suddenly everyone goes, Oh my God, they're a terrible person. So I'm like, yeah, they, they, yeah, it's, it's really easy to tell terrible people. Um, and I've been privy to many conversations, um, being guests, a guest of a convention or whatever, I'll be sharing a table with these people and I go, Oh my gosh, that is a horrible take. Um, <laughs> that's, that is not, that is not good. Um, and, uh, I'm never going to work with you and they still get, they still get work. Um, yeah. Hey Jameson, how's it going? Um, so yeah, so those are those are the resources. So when people come to me and say, "Oh, just put these big names into your show, and people will come watch them," there's a lot personally to me that I I, I just can't do that. I I don't I don't enjoy that. Uh, it really for I I might do it for something like a charity stream or something that I know is a one shot. It's not going to affect a table long term, and I need to get butts and seats. Um, 
but for any sort of long term or even like an RPG exploration society that's you know three or four uh, or five episodes long, I, I don't like putting people who um, who I know are are toxic. So it makes it difficult to cast things that way. Um, I want to move on to uh, and, and yes, fun again. Um, how you doing? Um, 100%. Uh, um, big names do not equal viewers. They don't always equal viewers. That's, that's, that's an important distinction. But we have had a number of people with hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of followers come on our stream and our average concurrent viewers went up maybe by two. Uh, because a lot of times these people aren't telling their audience that they're going to be on our show. They, they're either embarrassed. That's what hurts. That's what my mind keeps going back to. That's the anxiety and then, and then the depression. And then it starts, you know, whittling it all down. But I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Um, or uh, they forget. Uh, they're, they are, you know, they can't be bothered or whatever. They, they'll, they'll tweet out like a minute before they go live. I, I don't see them. <laughs> constantly i'll go like all right five four three and they're like oh wait i'm sending a tweet out right now that's uh that's annoying uh wait i need to scroll up i need to scroll up um dork lord canada on youtube um Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, he says, if Watsi is a whale in the, in, in the industry, the number two company, Paizo, is really a large tuna by comparison. Folks don't understand the scale involved, 100%. It's, it's, it's apples and oranges. It's, it's apples and uh, um, uh, cell phones. <laughs> It's really, it's it's a completely different metric, honestly. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that stuff, but I want to kind of get into revenue um, and talk a little bit more about revenue. Um, and I hear people say, but Dom, it shouldn't be about money. We can just perform on camera. You know, the mere act of creating is payment enough. That's all well and good until uh they see a donation come through and then suddenly it's money please and that's fine um they're worth it and I, i'll talk about a bit about that in a second but um there's this the, this dueling dynamic where people are saying i don't want it to be about the money but if money's there i want to have it yeah we all don't want it to be about the money. I want to do this for the fun of it. Um, but uh, if income is had, I want people to be able to share in that and, and, and um, you know, recoup their time and uh, devotion to it. So it's, it's, it, that's a hard thing to navigate. Um, I get it. And people are very stressed when money comes into a creative endeavor. Money certainly has a way of mucking things up. But no one wants to deal with taxes or payroll or literally making ends meet so that the channel stays on the air. That's not fun or exciting. But in order to afford the resources needed to produce an actual play on the caliber that we do it and that I want to do, one must have the money to spend. Uh, whether you're streaming in a garage or you have a studio, there are always costs to pay. These could be sunk costs, you, like you, if you already have the equipment or you're already paying a mortgage um, for the house that the garage is attached to, or they could be new costs. You need to pay your cast or you need to buy new equipment. 
And unless you're independently wealthy and don't need to care about a return on that investment, you're going to need to find a way to make that money, ideally from the thing that you're spending the money on. That's how businesses work. <laughs> I never looked at saving throw as a hobby. A hobby is one thing. People spend big bucks on hobbies, and that's okay. But many in the streaming RPG industry are going into it, treating it like a hobby, but expecting business-like results. And that's a backwards way of looking at it, in my opinion. Not only that, but it affects the industry as a whole. It can uh, devalue the business, because after all, if it's a hobby, you're probably more than happy to get free swag, or maybe a small stipend, if anything. But a hobby isn't supporting the cast and crew, let alone a studio. Um, and I always wanted Saving Throw to provide, not just to me, but to the performers who came and played with us, to the crews. I knew it had the potential, and so I treated it thus. So, um, Allow me to break down a typical saving throw bare bones budget as it stands right now. This is not standard in the industry. This is not final. Uh, this is not even the best I've done for people. Um, but it is the standard that I currently have that I, that I use when I start to approach sponsors and as I budget the channel. Um, the... Uh, Average saving throw show has 10 episodes in a season. Our indie rate has wages set at a total of $335 per show. This covers a tech director slash producer, the GM, and four players. Plus another $165 in an episode for miscellaneous expenses uh, that are kind of amortized over the run of the show, like a personalized theme song, uh, a cool intro, um, props, costumes, photos, character art, VTT needs, things like that. So that's around $500 an episode or $5,000 for a full season. And honestly, these are bargain basement prices, um, which leads me to my next point. Why, if it's so expensive, do I pay people? Simple. Their time is worth it. Bottom line, period. Um, my time is worth it. Without people performing on the channel and spending two to three hours a week with us or more, uh, <laughs> the channel simply doesn't make content. No content means no revenue. And so I choose to thank those players by paying them. It goes deeper than that, though, um, because the channel earns money based off the work that of others, the people playing the game in this case. I feel it's my duty to compensate them as well as I can. In order to compete in the Hollywood market um, where Saving Throw started, this meant sometimes paying much more than even some of our larger studio colleagues. Um, I, I grew up as an actor. I, I did professional, semi-professional theater um, for a while in, in Seattle, uh, did, um, you know, videos and, and commercials and stuff like that. I know what, what actors go through. Um, and we were predominantly working with actors or performers of some kind, stand up, comedians, improvisers, things like that. Those were the people that we typically worked with. Um, and, uh, that's, um, the, so the prices that I kind of come, uh, up with are, are rooted in that metric. Uh, I, I'm not paying McDonald's wages, um, although McDonald's should be paying much more. Um, that's a whole other topic, but, uh, <laughs> we're, we're not paying minimum wage here. Um, uh, and, and I, and I try to reflect that in what we do pay. Um, <laughs> oh, Jameson, uh, let me, let me, 
catch up a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, this is great. Yeah, you all have some great comments. I'm going to have to definitely try and go back and reread uh, everything because it's all good. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time. Um, so that's why I pay people. Um, what about other expenses? So, um, so we know that a 10-episode season costs five thousand um, uh, dollars. What other expenses do we have? So, uh, every month we have about twenty-two hundred dollars in miscellaneous business expenses. This includes past taxes, current taxes, future taxes payroll fees, Ko-Fi slash Patreon fulfillment costs, software subscriptions, etc. Uh, the website, all of that stuff comes to about $2,200 a month. Um, most of that, probably 80% of that uh, or 90% is taxes. Things like convention travel, once it's safe to do so again, uh, I'm not going to a convention anytime soon. Um, are no longer even on the budget. I, I can't even put them on there. Uh, and I would have to have travelers assume that cost themselves. In the past, we coordinated with, with folks to offset some of those costs. We would buy them the ticket to Gen Con or, or you know, like a, the Gen Con ticket, not a plane ticket or anything. But And then we would work to maximize hotels and stuff like that to help people. But we can't even afford to do that. Uh, and since 2020, I have not paid myself one red cent um, for any of the work that I've done at Saving Throw. Um, for a couple of years, though, um, I, I was able to, um, I, I had quit my, my full-time job and was able to subsist <laughs> um, uh, on, on, uh, on what we were making. But that also eats into all of you know, everything else. So uh, yeah, I had to get a, I had to get a day job to, um, to balance things out and to put, be able to keep things in saving throw to keep it afloat. So what's our revenue as, as uh fun again says on Twitch, does a single episode of said show bring in $500? No, <laughs> no, it does not. Um, so just how much are we making each month? Well, between Ko-Fi, Patreon, Twitch, which includes subs, ads, um, and tips, uh, YouTube, and TeePublic, we make a fairly consistent but ever so dwindling $1,500 a month. I say dwindling because each month we lose subs, either on Twitch or Patreon or Ko-Fi or all of the above. And while the switch to Ko-Fi has been largely successful and much improved over Patreon, we are still dealing with PayPal fees for each donation. So um, PayPal takes a lot out of your, um, your contribution. Ko-Fi doesn't take anything out, but PayPal still takes um, something along the lines of two, two to three percent plus 30 cents. Um, so yeah, PayPal, if we could get rid of PayPal, we'd be great, but there's not, you can't do anything about it. Uh, every day that we don't stream is essentially lost money on Twitch and YouTube. When we do stream, we are averaging about 35 concurrent viewers per stream, which is not bad by any means, uh, but it doesn't translate into a sustainable income. Most of the viewers are already subscribers uh, one way or another, uh, so we're not seeing many new viewers, which means we don't see new backers come in uh, during our streams. And I've tried to jumpstart this by like gifting subs and stuff, but that costs more than it generates, and it's also not sustainable. Um, well, thank you for that, Tyler. Thank you, thank you for donating on Ko-Fi. Yes, Ko-Fi, Ko-Fi is is the way to go. Um, if you are still backing on Patreon, cancel that, move over to Ko-Fi. It's much better uh, for us in the long run. Um, I, I will mention VODs in a second. Um, our YouTube needs uh, are, um, YouTube 
we need to drastically restructure our YouTube to fully capitalize on the format and the audience needs. Um, he, as you know, our, our video length is on average two to three hours. Uh, so the chance that someone's going to sit down and actually watch that is very, very slim. Our best performing videos are the videos that are five minutes or less. Um, or actually 10 minutes or less. Uh, those are, if you look at our, our like top 20 videos, they're all sketches, music videos, um, how to's, things like that. Those are, those are the best um, things, but they're really hard to produce. Uh, the, someone's got to write them. Uh, you've got to film them, all these things. They, they, they take almost more money than, um, than a show does. Um, streaming was, was, something that was low cost enough that we could do it because you could amortize it over the, the run of a, of a show. Anyway, um, we are by very nature an extremely low output YouTube studio by YouTube standards. Our YouTube vids tend to have their biggest income potential in the first two weeks after they're posted. Most YouTube videos are like that. Ours typically see between one and 300 views in that time. Um, the channel only gets paid if someone actually watches an ad, usually at least 30 seconds long. And sometimes only if they actually click a link in that ad. Um, it's all kind of a mystery as to what YouTube determines is a view uh, of that ad. Um, but uh, yeah, um, on average, only about 15% or fewer viewers actually watch an ad for the recommended 30 seconds. I mean, I can't blame them. I skip those ads all the time. So that's, if, if we're generous and we say that we have uh, 300 people viewing in the first two weeks, that's about 45 people out of that 300 who will actually watch an ad in the first two weeks. At an average of nine cents per ad, that's roughly four dollars in revenue, and that's pretty much it. Because after that, views decline rapidly. Over the course of years, we might double that to eight dollars over a video's entire life, uh, and that average is super skewed because. Um, we have like eight videos that are over a hundred thousand views each. Our top video uh, has has made. I, I think I think our top video has made something like forty bucks or something like that over its life, and it's been. I think we posted that in like 2015, 2016, something like that. So six or seven years. And, and it's made about 40 bucks. <laughs> and that's almost with a million views. Now, uh, if we could do a steady 10,000 views in the first month, our videos might be on a good path because the numbers would start averaging out. If we do 100,000 views, we'd be golden. That'd be great. But we're, we're way far from that. Um, yeah, YouTube used to pay a lot more. We used to we used to average about a hundred bucks uh, a month. Now we're averaging about sixty five bucks a month. Um, that's that's from YouTube. That's from thousands of videos. We have like over twelve hundred videos, I think, on YouTube. And out of twelve hundred videos, we're making sixty five dollars a month. <laughs> um, so how do other TTRPG producers get by? Um, I know a lot of producers tend to eat these costs themselves uh, through some disposable income that they have access to, or they simply don't pay for many of these expenses, opting to just ignore items like taxes and payroll that they may be legally obligated to pay depending on their state. Some will share the revenue with their cast and crew rather than pay a standard rate. 
And for a long time, we paid a low guaranteed rate plus a percentage of revenue. But at the rate we actually earn via tips, et cetera, shares for that typically resulted in like $10 or less per episode per person. Uh, and in LA's competitive market, that meant that players were constantly looking for a better deal, uh, a different group to stream with. And we lost a lot of a lot of players and a lot of shows because of that. But regardless, in California anyway, um, we were legally required to pay our cast as employees and not independent contractors. That's no longer the case, at least not explicitly, but it's still a common standard. Uh, so no matter how much we paid, uh, or uh, so no matter how we paid or how much we paid, uh, all of it needed to get reported. Um, but we also got to write it off, <laughs> so there's that. Um, still, many producers will say, I'm only paying them X amount for a few weeks' work. I'm just not going to report it, which is fine. I'm not going to judge you. Um, but uh, if you're getting, let's say Twitch is paying you $1,000, Twitch is going to send the IRS that amount. And the IRS is going to say, hey, Twitch, you made $1,000 on Twitch. Pay up. And if you can't say, well, I spent that $1,000 on such and such, then you're going to be paying a lot of money on, on that, and you're not going to get a whole lot back. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it, didn't, it doesn't make sense to me to um, kind of ignore that stuff. Uh, and, um, yeah, <laughs> I just, I just, I don't do that. Um, so, uh, Twitch, Patreon, Ko-Fi, um, PayPal, they all send, uh, actually Ko-Fi doesn't cause it's all through PayPal, but PayPal does, um, PayPal, Patreon, T public, uh, anything we get revenue from sends that revenue to the IRS and the IRS says, okay money please and um we've got to we have to report that on taxes uh and i have to say oh but actually you know of that thousand dollars that twitch gave me 900 of it went to paying cast and crew so i really only made a hundred dollars oh okay well that's different um but some people just go i don't know i'll just eat that up i'll just eat that extra bit up and not report it I don't know, to each their own, but I won't do that. <laughs> That's a complicated loophole thing that I just, I don't even want to get into. Um, and many independent studios either don't pay or they pay very, very little. And worse, they don't ask for what they're worth from sponsors. So they drive the prices down for everyone. I know this firsthand. I, this happened to us. We, um, we reached out. I, I tell this story often, <laughs> so forgive me if I'm saying it again. Um, but uh, we were approached by a company to uh, produce a show. We gave them our rates, the rates that other companies had agreed to uh, and had paid us before in the past. And um, they balked. They said, no, no, that's far too much. Why would we pay you to do that? Um, and I was convinced to lower our rate. And I said, I don't really want to lower the rate because what if we can't ever bring it back up again? But I was convinced, no, no, let's get in with this group. Let's, let's show them that we... We are, we are team players and we can, we can get this done. So I said, okay. So we lowered our rate considerably um, to the point where we could barely pay anybody. Uh, and, um, but we were getting a show uh, on, on this, uh, this, this channel. Well, okay. That's all well and good, but comes to a second season and oh look lo and behold company does not want to pay more certainly and they still think that what they're paying us is still too much not only that but now i get an angry email from a colleague 
who says, what the hell did you just tell this company? Because now they're not paying us. They don't want to pay us what we've been charging them in the past because now they think they can get it for a lot less. So a lot of independent RPG streaming producers, hear me out when I tell you, please don't undersell yourself. Because if you do, you are underselling all of us. And it really has a huge effect on the industry. Um, it's not a healthy industry by, by any stretch for this very reason. Um, and I'm not even going to get into like standard rates or anything. That's a topic that I've broached in blog posts and, and seminars before, and it deserves its own discussion. But suffice to say, Saving Throw has been competing not just with large established production companies capable of charging high rates to sponsors, but also with small independent producers who charge far too little. It's an uncomfortable ground to be on as a producer because you can't pay performers as much as established studios but you also can't earn enough because hundreds of other people are driving costs down by underselling themselves all right something a little interesting how the games we play might prevent more revenue that's a clickbaity title but um, bear with me. So I promised a while ago that I would talk about how certain games drive certain audiences. It's no secret that the vast majority of TTRPG, current TTRPG players, are playing or have heard of D&D. And I've talked at length about how WotC has capitalized on streams, mostly thanks to Critical Role, if I'm being honest. Um, uh, but they've capitalized on these streams to promote their own content. And they funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars into the industry. They even pit <laughs> themselves, pit against themselves. <laughs> Number five will shock you. Yeah. Um, but WotC is literally paying competing channels that are broadcasting at the same time to be playing D D so that when the average joe goes to um watch twitch and watch an rpg they're flooded with all these streams that are playing D, &D. uh and yeah okay how does that affect the type of audience well when RPGs as a streaming experience began, roughly, I will say, January 2015, streamers almost instantly added a pay-what-you-will element to that game. I'm not going to say Saving Throw invented that, but I'm pretty sure we were one of the first ones to do it um, and pioneer that tip structure. And while big streamers tended to shy away from that, um, they would nonetheless utilize the tactic for uh, charity streams and subathons and stuff. The, generally, the bigger streamers could rely on subscription income. They didn't need to worry about tip income. Okay, that's fine. But it created an atmosphere of this is how D&D is played, almost. It created an engagement between audience and player, at, much to the consternation of a lot of RPG players themselves. A huge component of the RPG audience are not even remotely interested in streamed RPG. So I, there's probably, I don't know, let's just say for sake of argument that there's about a million people who are into streamed or um, podcasted. There's probably more podcast fans, but are into streamed RPGs. All right. Uh, in terms of audience size, that's maybe, I don't know, a 1%, <laughs> I'm, I'm bad at math, uh, of, of all RPG audiences, it's huge. Um, uh, so um, that's, uh, that's amazing to me, honestly. That, that there's a huge component of the RPG industry audience that is not even remotely interested in RPG streams. Um, 
so uh, when 5e came out, which was around 2015, uh, it, it was an opportunity for WotC to basically rewrite the book on RPGs. D&D had name recognition, but many diehard players had moved to Pathfinder or something else to continue the RPG experiences and knowledge that they grew up with. The, the players at that point in January 2015, players of RPGs far outnumbered the viewers but once Critical Role took hold in March of 2015, um, nerds across the spectrum, because they had a huge platform in, on Geek and Sundry, began clamoring for D&D. They, they, there was a built-in audience already provided for them. Uh, plus, with a brand new system in 5e that everyone was learning together, it was a perfect storm to build a play structure that encouraged engagement and entertainment. So D and D fans, especially stream D and D fans, um, which are huge now, um, are predisposed to um, the tipping structure and and everything and the engagement between you know subs and all of that stuff with D and D streams. They they understand that they grew up with it, for lack of a better term. Now cut to a non-D&D RPG. These games haven't really had the streaming renaissance that D&D had. And they didn't have any name recognition within the streaming community at large, due in large part to the way Twitch handled things with regards to categories. Non-D&D streaming is common now, although it sees a fraction of the numbers that D&D streams see. So to combat the lack of recognition in the streaming world, you have to try and appeal directly to the RPG fans, to that RPG's fans, in an effort to build an audience. But many of those RPG fans don't want to see a streamification of their beloved game. They have an idea of what a streamed game is like. And whether it's a grognard or whatever, they have latched onto this belief that they don't like it and they don't want it to happen to their game. Um, and a lot of these new D&D fans that grew up and streamed, uh, streamed RPG games don't know, don't care, or don't understand that there are RPGs beyond D&D. It's like listening to one radio station your whole life and then suddenly finding out that there's cable TV with hundreds, thousands of channels. Without a TV guide or a trusted aggregator, uh, it's nearly impossible to find the content that you want. So our D&D streams kind of got lost in the milieu of everyone else's D&D streams. They never really gained traction enough until Pirates of Salt Bay. But even then, we'd have far fewer viewers than, say, a stream that was just a battle map with disembodied voices that had no cameras, no production value, but thousands of viewers. That's frustrating, considering how much we put into these shows. And our non d d streams would suffer even more because we didn't have the Twitch topology to help us. Twitch really screwed the pooch when they had D&D as the only RPG category for years. I deliberately streamed under uh, the tabletop RPG category um, because I knew it had to grow. It, it, we had to stream under that because if we didn't, we would never grow non D and D games. Um, and but the these new D and D fans only knew of D and D because Twitch marketed any RPG as D and D. Um, you can finally create your own tags. Twitch just allowed just started this, so you can finally go under tabletop RPGs and then type in you know, something specific. But God help us, when we were streaming under Savage Worlds, oh my God, it was, there's d and this huge block, and then you had tabletop RPGs, which was 
sizable but far smaller than D&D as a category. And then you had a couple of games that had their own category like Savage Worlds. So you know how minuscule that, that audience has to be looking? You have to have someone who knows to look for Savage Worlds, who is familiar with Twitch as a platform and knows to look for Savage Worlds in the category system to even find that. So we ended up going over to tabletop RPGs um, and streaming under there because there was more of an audience in there and we might get discovered some way. So we're not gaining new Twitch viewers because they don't even know to look for us. And we can't gain non-D&D players en masse because many of them are predisposed not to like the Twitch environment, aka supporting the channel. <laughs> They want a podcast experience um, from their RPG entertainment. And, and that's fine. Uh, but we're, it, it's, you can't like, there's, there are not pockets necessarily of uh, the streaming audience. Um, there's a huge component that are, there's watching one show and they, very rarely break off and watch another channel. A lot of it has to do with time, but also a lot of it has to do with discovery. And it goes back to marketing and everything like that. So, so what does this mean? This is gonna be a little haphazard because honestly, this was the part I had kind of the most difficulty writing because I don't really know what this means. Um, I know many of you who are watching right now have supported Saving Throw through thick and thin. And some for years and others, you just started supporting us just now. And, and I thank you all from the bottom of my heart, truly. It's to you that I say that Saving Throw isn't completely dead. Um, I still have a sponsored stream or two coming up later this year. Um, an RPG Exploration Society I know for sure happening in October. Um, however, no new content will be produced unless it's fully sponsored or we somehow make up those numbers through new subs, preferably through Ko-Fi. Um, this is disappointing on a number of levels, not least of which because it precludes us from showcasing some really awesome games from independent RPG producers. Um, and, uh, simply because there's just no budget to produce it, um, either independently um, or um, or from the publisher. Uh, it also prevents me from hiring anybody to help create content on a more frequent uh, basis or creating shorter content that I know can nab better audiences and stuff. Um, we just don't have that money. So... To break it down to brass tacks, we need at least 550 additional, that's brand new, scout level, that's $5 a month, Ko-Fi backers, just to support one new show on the channel on an ongoing basis. That's just to break even. Um, that's a lot. Our current levels on Ko-Fi Patreon, coupled with alternative revenue streams like T Public, and YouTube and Twitch, almost combined to cover our essential costs. Remember, our essential costs are about $2,200 a month. Um, but uh, we're making about $1,500 a month. That does not include any cost to, uh, to produce a show. So that, that $2,200 that we pay every month is almost entirely going to the United States government, to be perfectly honest. Um, so 550 additional scout level Ko-Fi backers on top of what we have right now will get us to the point where we can pay the $2,200 a month and produce a show on an ongoing basis. If I wanted to grow the channel confidently, uh, I'd need at least 700 scout level Ko-Fi backers added to the roster. This um, this would allow me to start saving 
money to put towards a discretionary budget to support additional content, convention costs, marketing expenses, things like that. Uh, if we wanted to do two shows a week and continue to grow as well, we'd need roughly 600 additional new Ko-Fi backers. That's 1,300 Ko-Fi backers at the $5 level. And this is still doing things remotely. We're a long way from being able to afford a studio. Uh, studio costs are in the tens of thousands of dollars. I lucked out with the studios that we had, uh, but all of our money went to the studios and then I didn't have any money to pay the taxes. <laughs> so that's kind of how that went. Uh, not to mention we had, uh, we had to get equipment and then you have to pay for insurance, stuff like that. It's, um, it's a lot. And I've had trouble just converting people from Patreon to Ko-Fi. People who are already supporting us on Patreon to get them to move over to Ko-Fi as a sustaining member. Um, I've had trouble doing that. I've had trouble, I've repeatedly set goals on, on Twitter and, and our socials, you know, hey, we need to hit this number by this X date. Um, and, you know, it doesn't really, no, no one sees it. Uh, so we've seen very few new backers crop up. Uh, what's all this in dollars? Um, in order to pay off our current tax debt and stay afloat, just breaking even with no shows, but keeping up our Ko-Fi endeavors. So the one page, monthly one page things, um, uh, um, stuff like that. We'd need $5,000 cash. Next year's taxes will probably be close to the same $8,000 that it was for the last two years. So ideally we'd save for that this year, which means an additional $2,000 a month for the rest of the year. Um, and to do one more new show is, is approximately $2,000 a month. That's paying cast in and a crew person, but doesn't cover anything like marketing, et cetera, which I'd essentially still be doing pro bono. Um, so long as I can pay people though, I'm, I'm less concerned about myself, but I'm not going to do a show if I can't pay people. That's basically what it comes down to. Um, so yeah. Uh, thank you, Casey. Thank you for, for subscribing on Ko-Fi. I appreciate it. Um, I've always said that quality is better than quantity. While our audience is small, um, they are mighty. Many of you watching this now have committed not insignificant amounts to us over the years towards our initiatives. And um, I'm not asking you to commit to more. What we need are new fans, essentially. We need new people coming in. Um, things that I think we, that I want to do but I can't, but that I think might be kind of cool. Uh, I want to keep doing RPG Exploration Society because it's a great way to showcase systems. And I, a lot of people agree with it. However, um, it suffers from a length factor. Uh, it's, the episodes are, are generally contained to two hours, which is, which is pretty good if you know our, our history. But, um, Two hours is still about uh, an hour and a half too long for most people. Um, so uh, ideally, we'd have someone editing our RPG Exploration Societies down so that they're a little bit more bite-sized. And Bondo, you, you say um, saving throw shorts, but yes, um, one of the things that I think could be really helpful is, is actually starting a new channel that is all of our old content cut up uh, into more manageable bits. We used to do that, actually. The first couple of years, I did cut everything up into essentially 45 to 55-minute chunks. Um, but what I found was that people weren't... We weren't necessarily engaging people any better than our longer-form content. Um, and so it was just kind of adding work that wasn't really coming back to me, but... I'd be interested in trying that again 
it's just a huge time endeavor. Like I said, we have over 1,200 videos. Most all of them are three plus hours long. So going through all of that footage and re-editing it is not something that I necessarily have the time to undertake. Um, but I do think that it could potentially help us. It's just a little hard to tell right now. And I don't know if I can put the energy into that without a guaranteed um, outcome. Um, uh, things that I think would be really fun. Um, I have really, really wanted to do a, uh, a web series um, in the Weird West. Um, not necessarily Deadlands, but Deadlands inspired, perhaps, uh, and Wildcards inspired. Um, not using the same characters or anything, but uh, maybe one or two, some, some things. I really wanted to explore James Bogue's, uh, how he came to be. And so I, can't, I really wanted to do that. Um, that's, a, that's a really expensive undertaking. Um, and, but I think it could be really cool. And it would, uh, I think, kind of um, help give um, a, a thing like Savage Worlds, like Deadlands, uh, like Haunted West, like Coyote and Crow, um, uh, kind of a push, a media push that maybe they, they aren't expecting. None of those companies have the money to afford um, those companies are those individuals, really. Um, uh, Roland asks, uh, YouTube, are, are all the shows on the cloud or did I make any local backups? I, everything is, everything, but I think about two weeks worth of shows is backed up. Um, we had a backup problem for like two weeks and it, and affected like two shows, unfortunately, but, uh, yeah, everything else I have backup. So I can edit them. I don't have to pull them off of the, the web, but, um, yeah, it's still a lot. <laughs> and yes, it's terabytes of footage. Anyway, um, yes. So uh, I, I, I've i had this dream in my head um, of, of how I wanted to produce it. Um, I live in a great state uh, for shooting Westerns um, and I would love to do it. It's just, it's expensive. Um, and it's basically, I either do that or I do more RPG content. You know what I mean? Um, and, and it would, that would be more of like a Kickstarter type thing, um, than a, a Ko-Fi type thing, but it could be a Ko-Fi thing. It could be a goal, uh, you know, uh, on Ko-Fi. So that's something I really... I really, really want to do, um, but it, yeah, like I said, it, it costs a lot of money, a lot more than it costs to do a streaming show. So personally, I think it's a little far out there, but um, that's something that I think could be really cool. Um, I mentioned a new, sh a new channel with uh, re-edited shortened versions of shows. Um, that's also a huge undertaking. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing that has come up is animated versions of uh, our shows, particularly wild cards, but, but also some other shows. Um, I met with a company that does animation uh, and um, for a reasonable fee, they, they can kind of turn certain things into an animated piece. We're not talking like, half hour long episodes or anything like that. We're talking maybe 15, 30 seconds, maybe at most like five minutes. Um, uh, even so that's like a thousand dollars or something like that. Um, it's still extremely reasonable for an animated, uh, endeavor. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've talked a lot about taking some scenes out of wild cards and, and animating them, uh, just as a, like, you know, maybe if if you're on the fence about um, watching a three plus hour long um, Weird West RPG, uh, maybe a 15 second 
animation uh, of a key scene might be interesting to to you. Um, so it's really kind of a marketing thing, uh, but again, it's it's also money, and it's it it adds an additional expense to our all of our other costs. So that's that's a thing. Also, think would be really cool. Um, uh, but, um, but again, it's, it's money and it, going back to my time, um, I like all of it and I wish I could do all of it, but I, I, I have to pick one thing to kind of go after, um, and let that be my, my thing. Um, uh, another thing that we could potentially do again is, is have someone else produce shows, um, and at least keep content going on the channel uh, and then they can keep the proceeds, whatever proceeds they make. Uh, and the, the channel keeps whatever subs or Ko-Fi are raised. Um, something or, you know, some sort of split the difference type thing. Um, but I, I, re I really am hesitant to that because I, I don't, necessarily micromanage although I do kind of for sure but um, I I definitely um, I sort of lost my train of thought I, I I I want to be kind of connected to it in some way and I want to know what's kind of getting made and and all of that stuff so there's there's maybe a few people that I trust to produce things like that, but um, also it's their time and, and what, what they can do and, and stuff. Um, uh, yeah, Roland on YouTube says I could try a co-op with a channel that specializes in animating scenes. That's essentially what I've, um, who I've been talking to, uh, but you know, they have bills to pay too. Uh, it, it costs a lot to animate things, um, surprisingly. <laughs> and uh, they, you know, none of them really do it for free. Uh, there's only a few that might do an, like an animatic, like a 10 or 15 second animatic for, for free maybe. Um, these people have actually, uh, um, we worked out if, if we were to do a Kickstarter of some kind, they would happily do a sort of proof of concept animatic for us for free um, with, with the knowledge that they would get paid you know, if the project moved forward. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's something. Um, somehow have better partnerships with RPG companies, not just financial, but marketing wise. Um, RPG companies have the key to their clientele. Uh, and this was, um, this was how wildcards continued to be successful. Uh, Pinnacle didn't even sponsor wildcards, but uh, they did sponsor some non wildcards content, but they didn't sponsor wildcards itself. Um, but they promoted it and they promoted it to their people and their, um, their audience. And uh, that um, honestly helped us exponentially. Wizards of the Coast, we did stuff for them. Paizo, we did stuff for them. Um, uh, who else? Renegade. Um, you know, uh, we did uh, stuff for a lot of different companies, and none of them ever tweeted about us. None of them ever did anything. Sometimes they would invite uh, a GM or something on a podcast or whatever, but they never did anything else. Um, so, yeah, more companies that would help market um, would be great. Um, I want Saving Throw to be an RPG production studio for the masses, um, presenting the content that you want to see and showcasing titles you want to know about or that I think you should know about. Um, and I want content that reflects my ideals as well as the transformative nature of RPGs. That's what I want Saving Throw to be um, moving forward. Um, but yeah, 
uh, you've, you've heard me talk for an hour and a half now about um, the industry and the difficulties we're facing. And, and honestly, if I can't put too, po- too fine of a point on it, saving throw probably won't continue after the new year um, unless we see um, a, a drastic shift in um, backing of some nature or some angel investor comes in and gives us the money we need. You know, we get a big sponsor again or something like that. Um, the only like long-term sponsor that we had was, uh, was Hero Forge and they sponsored sponsored a hundred dollars an um yeah a hundred dollars an episode so episodes only cost us four hundred dollars to produce (laughs) when when we had that so yeah um but even hero forge is not um they're they're moving out of that uh that biz so they're not really sponsoring channels so much anymore Especially because we're not playing, uh, we're playing remotely. So uh, it's kind of hard to showcase, you know, miniatures um, that way and play with them. So anyway, uh, I, I'm going to take uh, a half an hour for any sort of questions, comments that you have. If I didn't respond to your comment um, uh, in this whole thing, just ask it again. And, and I'll try and get to it. Um, let me pull this over here so I can better see what's going on. Oh, thank you, Blind Seer. Oh, thank you. That, I, that, that means a lot. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll just get other people <laughs> and get new people. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, Torch Dragon. Yeah, yeah. It's the creator curse. Um, thanks. I, I love you guys, too. I really do. Um, not a lot of people, you know, uh, understand kind of the nature. And and I feel like, um, to Diana Moon's point, the community, what I've always tried to do is be transparent with you and let you know how things are made here um, without calling out the business practices necessarily of our colleagues, um, which at times are circumspect, but um, thank you. Thank you, Funageddon. Uh, Gosh, you guys, Um, no, thank you. Thanks, thank you, Diana Moon. Um, But yeah, I've tried to be, tried to do that. And you as an audience have, have honestly come back to me and, you know, shown me that you really do understand it. And, And I hope I hope that we can um, expand that to to the to these new people who are maybe just no critical role, uh, and so don't really know that there's there's life out there. There's there's a whole world of content um, that they that they don't know, and that would be truly special. I think if if we could get to that point, uh, America. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't think we're going to solve everything tonight. We're, you know, we're, we're not going to raise the money that we need to, to keep going and, and, and producing content tonight. I, I know that, um, will we, will we get there in Innocent Artificer? Thank you so much. Will we get there in, um, see, this is what RPG, uh, many RPG fans hate. They hate stopping, you know, and, and acknowledging that Twitch the live aspect, the engagement aspect of Twitch, they hate that. Um, but I do it. I'm going to do it anyway because uh, I love you guys. Um, anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. No. We we need. Um, yeah. Dollar wise, if I, if I'm being perfectly frank. Dollar wise, and in, in, in order to pay off our current taxes, um, I think it's forty five hundred dollars is our current tax burden for the for twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty two's taxes uh, next year are probably going to be around eight thousand uh, dollars, 
uh, if the last two years are any indication as to what that might be. Um, Jameson, thank you. Diana Moon, thank you so much. Um, so that's just our tax burden. So $4,500 is owed. Uh, $8,000 is the what we're trying to save up for for next year so we can essentially pay it off. Um, and then we have another $2,200 uh, or sorry, less than that. Um, that includes essentially what we're paying for taxes and trying to save for taxes. So $2,200. Uh, let me let me look at the numbers here. If I if I take that all into account. Yeah. Um, Yeah, we're we're closer to like seven hundred dollars or something um, <laughs> uh, uh, as a monthly monthly expenditure if we can, if we take out taxes if we can pay our taxes, yeah, something like that. Don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> I'm doing rough math in my head with a massive spreadsheet that I have in here um, that I've created. Uh, truly, I wish I could share this spreadsheet, um, but it's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense to anybody but me. Um, but uh, I have I've calculated down to, you know, down to the person how much each show costs and and stuff like that, and it's all related and connected and interconnected. And I'll just say Google Sheets is awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, Jay Matthews, uh, that, yeah, I'm so sorry for your loss. Uh, part of why uh, my partner and I moved to um, Utah was because her father was dying of cancer. And uh, we lost him at the beginning of this year. And, you know, I lost, I lost my mom um, in 2003. And, uh, I know, I know what it's like. And uh, not to be crass, um, but to kind of put it in context of, of what we're talking about, the thing that is important to me is that saving throw kind of reflects that life. This is why, you know, when players come to me and they say, I need a mental health day, and I've got 10 minutes before the show goes live, I give them the mental health day. Like I, I don't, I don't, um, I, it's important to me that people do that. Uh, and it's important that Saving Throw recognizes that and, and we can reflect that in our content and how we conduct business. Um, but it, it's hard and I'm so happy that that we were able to help you through that time in, in an indirect way. Um, it, honestly, it's stuff like that 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 makes me um, shout to the rooftops uh, uh, about this. So I, I thank you so much um, for for sharing your life with us. Honestly. Um, okay, I won't hold my breath, Torch Dragon, but thank you. Yeah. Um, it really is. It really is sharing, um, sharing this, uh, finding, finding the, the thing that really works well is, is personal, um, personal accounts. Uh, uh, you know, we, <sighs> I have a huge, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I have a huge section in this document that I wrote up that is, um, uh, that is stuff I shouldn't talk about. <laughs> um, because I, I don't, I, I talked a little bit about, about my consternation regarding the TTRPG streaming social media thing. Um, and uh, I mentioned that, that um, I feel like there is a 
a lot of toxic positivity out there. Um, there's a lot of just toxic nature out there. And there's just a lot of um, mental thirst traps. Uh, and so I really, I, uh, ment my mental health thirst traps, I should say. Um, and uh, a lot of sociopathic behavior, if I'm being perfectly honest. And I don't like going there. I, I, I certainly have my own things that I go through that I take medications for, that I, you know, see a therapist for when I can, things like that. But I, I don't like using that as a bargaining chip. So I, I, I try not to talk about those types of things um, as much as they may frustrate me. Um, because what I recognize is that a lot of that stuff generates a lot of views and, um, it's frustrating. I, yeah, I, I, it's just frustrating. And I recognize that everyone has to deal with it, um, has to deal with their own problems, their own ways and stuff, but it, it, it sucks when that um, basically some people get to a point where they recognize that every time they do that, their follower account goes up and it creates this vicious cycle that people feel they need to feed into by relaying their, their mental state at every stage. And, and uh, it's, I don't know, it's really difficult. So I try not to get into my personal life so much um, and keep it separate. But I recognize that that also has hindered the growth of the channel because social media is built to um, raise up that, um, that behavior. So anyway, Yeah, um, yeah, toxic positivity uh, uh, basically um, serves, uh, uh, says that everything is great without acknowledging that anything is bad. Um, and uh, you get this a lot when people go, you know, who, everyone have a great day, you know, just produce content. I got a lot of hate for asking the question what people found wrong with actual plays. A lot of people were like, just create what you want. That's fine. But there, there are things <laughs> that uh, are required for you to produce that content by not acknowledging the fact that there are difficulties in this business. Uh, you are creating um, this perception that A, anyone can do it, and B, um, if you do run into problems, uh, then you must be the one outlier and you're not any good at it because everyone told you how easy it was, how you should just do what you want. Um, it's a super, it's a hard thing to, to do because you don't want to tell the people that are positive. You don't want to say, hey, stop being positive. But that term toxic positivity is um, is detrimental because, or not the term itself, but the but the practice of it, um, because it's hard to see, it's hard to recognize, and it's hard to call out. Um, but it is super prevalent, especially that I see it in the in the streaming community personalities. So. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, it hides the real struggles that come with being human. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like DJ Regular said, yeah, the positive affirmations on things like mental health, diversity, etc. that actively refuse to engage with the fact that problems exist and need to be dealt with. Um, Yes, if you start seeing a people that 
are not reflecting these problems or not reflecting them um, uh, or, or you, you um, let me backtrack. Uh, Facebook for a long time still does. Um, you only see a snippet of a person. You see these pictures, you see them holding hands with their loved one, walking on the beach, taking, traveling, buying a new car, whatever. And you see these things, and you're like, oh man, that person is doing great. They are so put together. But you don't, and that person says, oh, I love my wife. I love my husband. I love, you know, whatever. Um, I, I love my job. I love this, I love that. You don't see the struggles that they have day to day with that wife, with that husband, with that job, with that car, whatever. Um, they don't post that. And that's a sort of passive toxic positivity. Uh, but then you also have people who, who are literally um, creating discourse on toxic positivity they are they are starting a conversation on social media saying that everything is great um, and there's no problem whatsoever in the world and um, and I won't have any any anything otherwise and then you completely shut out everybody and yeah you make people feel worse that they're not having a good day um, yeah uh anyway <laughs> that's a, that's a little diatribe um uh blind seer i think you asked um <laughs> okay sorry thank you fantasy animal vegan kiganis oh yes thank you um amazing amazing i i still yeah i i think I think that Eric has the map that has all of the Dark Sun, um, all all the things uh, that we had in Dark Sun that we created with uh, with backers. Oh my gosh, Dark Sun! The, the, the amount of vitriol um, in the comments section uh, uh, of that—that's um, probably one of our most uh, um, loathed. YouTube um, series, despite how amazingly awesome it was, uh, I can't, people just cannot get past some of the things that um, Sean did with that. Anyway, uh, Blind Seer, you asked if I could do anything, what would I do? Um, personally, I would love to tell the story of James Bogue um, in, a, in a, a fashion. Um, it won't it won't deal really with uh, wild card stuff. It would be somewhat of a prequel, but not really. Um, and then it would be a kind of a, a, an alternate universe, James Bogue, in in the direction it would go. Um, uh, that's what I would love to do. I, 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 if I could, I, I mean, I've asked many times, but, but, uh, wild cards is not coming back. Um, uh, I would love to play that, um, again, but, um, yeah, yeah. It's just not in the cards. Um, if we could, like, I, I would be, I would, I would love to play, um, with the characters that we made for the RPG exploration society, uh, the saving throw how to, I would love to explore those characters more and, and do that. But honestly, that's a lot of work that I don't think I really have time for. Um, doing both tech and jamming is, is really hard. And, uh, I have a home game that I'm committed to as well, which is my first home game in years. Um, Garav and I played for, we did like maybe five sessions and then that home game dissolved. Uh, and um, that was like five years ago. So, or something, it was a long time ago. So uh, yeah, um, I, I would love to, to do more Weird West stuff. 
Um, but, but especially telling it in a video format like that, um, I mean, that's, that's been my dream for a long time is, is doing, is doing narrative content. Uh, and, you know, I did, I did a lot of that, um, did a lot of short form YouTube narrative stuff and, um, yeah, yeah, I just, I just dig it, but it's a lot of work too. Finding finding a cinematographer that you click with, finding a crew, finding locations, finding a cast, um, paying all these people, uh, and and stuff. Um, it it's 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 a lot of work, uh, quite frankly. So, yeah, if I if I did it, it would have to be at, at a level that I could bring in people that could you know help with that, that so that I wasn't doing it all myself. That's typically what happens. <laughs> is I do everything myself because um, it's much cheaper that way, but it's not good for my own mental health. Uh, home game. I am running, I am GMing a Curse of Strahd right now. And oh my gosh, I, I don't know that I really like D and D to be perfectly frank. Um, uh, to be perfectly dumb. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, I love, yes, I'm with you, Fantasy Animal Vegan. I love Ravenloft. I've loved it since second edition, um, when I first got introduced to it. I am digging the world. Um, uh, and, but yeah, I am finding that I'm having to adjust the rules a lot, um, to, to sort of make things work. And like, combat coming off of a game like savage worlds um combat just doesn't have the thing i i'm just going okay sorcerer cast fireball takes out a bunch of dudes um move on to the paladin the paladin cast smite does a bunch of damage but hey that guy's still up and he still can hit you as hard as he did before um it just it's uh, yeah uh bleh. I love the lore. I love everything. D and D's lore is fantastic, um, uh, even though it is borrowed heavily from other things. But uh, I will, I will always love the lore uh, involved. And and I, I am a sucker for an old, you know, um, X module or something like that, um, Isles of Dread or something. I love that stuff. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. Um, yeah, I've heard really good things. Um, Michael Sanders on YouTube says uh, Savage Pathfinder is pretty good. Yeah, I I haven't I haven't gone too deep into it. I may I've got my I've got my group. They, they're pretty willing to jump into Savage Worlds, so I may I may eventually move over there. My my thinking was we would finish off Curse of Strahd and then. Um, jump over, but we've been going for a year now. I'm really, really stoked about that. That we've that we've managed, and we've been doing it all remote. We all live in Salt Lake City, uh, but uh, um, but we've been doing it remote just for COVID reasons and stuff. So it, I I I'm super super happy, super happy uh, for that. Um, yeah. Honestly, uh, yes. What DJ Regular said, um, it's hard to recommend D&D unless you really want to play D&D. Um, and because D&D is so prevalent and everybody knows it, everybody wants to play D&D, right? And then you find out, oh, you play D&D and you don't like it. Then what? Then finding an RPG, you're, you, no one is guiding you. You're, you're not in those forums, really, right? Um, and that's, that's a really difficult thing that I've found is, is that the, these people come and they go, I don't really like D and D. Oh, and then they go, Oh, spell jammer, you know, and then everyone gets excited again and they go, they love Strixhaven. They love, you know, all the new lore and everything like that. And everyone loves building a character and then they get to it and they're like, well, this isn't fun. And it's like, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. You can have all the fun of the lore and the characters and um, all of that, but, and still have a resolution system that is functional and enjoyable and um, flowing and 
uh, helps with storytelling. Uh, that's the thing that I really like. I, and I, I love my players. Um, if you're watching right now, close, shut your muffs. Um, I love my players, but you know, to, to be honest, they're not necessarily, you know, performers like we have on saving throw. So, uh, it, it, sometimes I want to tell more of a story, but I'm not really getting much in return. And that's totally fine. I wasn't, I didn't go into a home game expecting it to be like saving throw. Um, I, in fact, emphatically didn't want it to be like saving throw, but I am finding that I, that I do like, you know, being able to tell a story more and D and D doesn't do that as well as other systems out there. Thank you, blind seer. Thank you so much. Yes. You can talk to me on discord, however you want. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll feel free to chat with me. Uh, that goes for all of you. You can find me on Discord. You can find me on social media. Um, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you have comments, please feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, I, you don't need to tell me, you know, anything. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm being honest with you. If if we don't hit goals before the end of the year, I there's just not much point in in trying to further content on saving throw. Um, that's just, that's just the truth of it. Um, so yeah, um, that's kind of where we're at. So yeah. Uh, but it, yeah, if there's a way, if you know of a way that, that we can make that happen, I'm, I'm more, more ears. Uh, I frankly, it, it destroyed me. I was talking with Steven uh, of New Pantheon fame, and um, we were talking about the new season of New Pantheon, and, and he has this banger idea for a new season of New Pantheon, and I love it. And I reached out, we were trying to find a sponsor, and I reached out to these gaming companies, and no one was biting. Um, and uh, I had to tell him, I said, listen, if we can't get a sponsor, I can't do a new season of New Pantheon. And it, it, it breaks me up because um, we have, and we've had so many shows like that, that I feel deserve an audience and tell such wonderful stories and ha feature such wonderful people. Um, and I want to promote them and do, do right by them. And um uh, we're just not able to grow. They're not able to find an audience beyond our standard audience. And um, it's a really hard thing to kind of come to because you can't help but look at it personally. Um, you know, poor Steven is thinking, oh, you know, another show gets canceled. Um, <laughs> and I, I hate that. Um, but yeah. Um, as uh, saving throw is uh, is currently um, a a sole proprietorship, aka for profit sole proprietorship. Um, we're not we're not incorporated, for lack of a better term. So, if if I were, I would probably do it as an LLC. Uh, nonprofit is is kind of a hard metric to do things under. We you have to prove that you are. Um, teaching for the, for the greater good, uh, and you're offering things for free, uh, and things like that. So, um, membership structures and income and all of that stuff is, is far more regulated. I can't do a lot of the things we do if I were to be a nonprofit. Uh, and then being like an LLC or something, we just don't make that much money to afford the costs to incorporate. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I've talked with lawyers and accountants all the time going, should I? Because I'm paying so much money in taxes and all this stuff. They're just all like, no, it doesn't matter. It's better to do it. Sole proprietorship. So that's that. Uh, angst on YouTube, uh, a special pledge drive that people can sign up to donate monthly, similar to how you do the end ALZ marathons. We've done those. We've done subathons before. Um, the thing is, um, subathons are... We haven't done one specifically for like Ko-Fi, uh, which may play out differently, but we have done subathons for Twitch before. And what happens is we get a lot of people subbing, 
Um, and then at the end of that month, uh, they all don't renew. Uh, mostly because they're gifting subs to like Matt Mercer, people who will never come and watch our channel basically, but are on Twitch. Uh, and so, you know, they'll, they'll gift these subs to all these people. Um, and, and then at the end of that month, none of these people ever come back and renew that subscription or take up that subscription baton. So subathons, from the Twitch standpoint, have rarely ever gone well. We will have a really good month, and then and then it just drops back to normal. Uh, however, I have thought about doing a subathon geared towards Ko-Fi. Um, that is something that I might I might do in in September or October. Um, just you know. I'm I'm down for doing last ditch efforts to try to get get people going, um, but yeah, uh, um, I don't know I don't know how well that would plan that, that would pan out. Again, we need new audiences to come in, and see us, and and support us, and that's really hard. Even even if we're streaming for 24 hours, it's really hard for someone to come in and go that's the group that I want to support from now on, you know? Um, so it, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of people saying, Hey, this is, this is the story that I want, um, about how saving throw has affected me or what I enjoyed watching saving throw. Um, yeah. Um, Yeah, I've thought about yeah, I've thought about the PBS pledge drive uh, uh, of of Kofi too. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that's um that's interesting. Kofi, um, th there it is. DJ Regular posted it in the uh, Twitch chat. Um, that's essentially our membership. That's taking the place of Patreon. Uh, uh, that we still operate. And if you are on Patreon, fine. But move over to Kofi. When when your year is up, most of the people who are still on there are uh, supported for a year, so I recognize that uh, Kofi doesn't allow um, yearly memberships yet. But uh, I hear that's coming in the future. Um, exactly, fun again. If someone's going to gift a bunch of subs, it's generally better just to just to give that money to us via Kofi. Um, you don't have to subscribe at that level. Just if you're going to outlay 25 bucks or whatever to gift to gift five subscriptions on Twitch, you might as well just send us a $25 donation on Ko-Fi. It it goes much further usually, uh, <laughs> because we get half of the money. Or uh, generally, we we might get more if they're higher subscriptions, but base level Twitch subscriptions we get half. So if it's a $5 subscription, $4.99, we get $2.50. Um, it goes something like 50, 30, uh, 50, 50, 60, 70, I think, um, in terms of percentages. Uh, let me see. I actually have it in, in my, uh, my spreadsheet of many wonders. Yeah, 50, 60, 70. So um, a $4.99 Twitch subscription, we get $2.50. Uh, a... Um, a 9.99 we get uh 60% of that <laughs> i a 24.99 we get 70% of that um yeah angst um uh the thing with a lot of those networks is they don't really have the the budgets to pay for what we do um at least not on our on our level. If we had a built-in audience like many of the podcasters and stuff on on Earwolf and and the, and uh, those other networks, if we had a large built-in audience, like I'm I'm talking like hundreds of thousands of people, um, uh, that would that would be um, more beneficial to them, and and they might be able to allocate some money. We tried working with the Fantasy Network folks, and the Fantasy Network is awesome, and we still collaborate. Uh, and we'll still collaborate with them, but um, they, that was part of the intention was that they would help support us uh, with income, but you know, it just didn't generate the income that anybody was hoping for, so it, it didn't really work out. But um, 
Yeah, that's that's a possibility. I wouldn't mind partnering with somebody if if it was right and we could I could continue doing the things that I want to do and like doing uh, and that saving throw is known for in the way that saving throw is known for it. But honestly, I'm really trepidatious to work with any other outside people because honestly, there's a lot of sociopaths out there. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, oh God, a lot of these people that, that, you know, work in this industry um, and in, in, I mean, not just streaming, but, YouTube videos and stuff like that are just, uh, they're, I don't know, they're not, they're not great. And I just, I know that I'm going to partner with that one group that you find out the guy, you know, is, is awful and terrible and all that stuff. I know it would just, it would just happen to me. I just know it. Um, anyway. Uh, okay. I have to wrap it up because I, I need to go home and I need to get something to eat. Uh, but I've really enjoyed talking to you. I hope that this has um, illuminated you uh, as to the plight of saving throw and and what we're kind of going through, um, and and what streaming the streaming industry in general kind of does. Uh, I, I feel there are a lot of layers underneath it, and um, you kind of have to peel that back to to see what's really going on. At, in in a lot of these places um so yeah i hope that you've learned something uh, i appreciate you so much uh everybody who came and and donated and who subbed up on ko-fi uh or um or on twitch or whatever uh everybody who follows us on youtube thank you uh yeah i keep watching please keep sharing let people know what you're what you're watching honestly you don't even have to say much beyond that, but just say, hey, I'm watching Pirates of Salt Bay right now, or I'm watching Dark Sun, or Uncanny Valley, or uh, City of Mist, or Mutants and Masterminds, or Shadowrun, or whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, please uh, get the word out any way you can in those forums, discords, um, yeah, whatever, wherever you can. Uh, if Whenever anybody asks, hey, what's your favorite streaming RPG channel, put a mention of uh, saving throw in there <laughs> because there are a lot of channels that I hear of that I've never, ever seen any content that they've done. Uh, and it surprises me. I actually started making a list of the, the people that everybody mentions as their, like their top five channels. And I made a list and I go, I never heard of any of those people. Uh, and that doesn't mean that they're not popular because they're vastly popular apparently, but, um, I don't know them. Uh, anyway, thank you. Yes. Um, I dearly love saving throw and I want to continue producing content. Uh, but it's, it's going to be scaled back probably no matter what. Uh, and it, yeah, and it could by the end of the year, it could it could be done producing new content entirely. Um, so we'll see, we'll see. But uh, I, I still have a few things up my sleeve um, this year, so um, we'll, we'll we'll try it. We'll try a few things. Um, yeah, glass. Sorry, yeah, glass cannon. Uh, angst asks about glass cannon. Yeah, glass cannons. Uh, they're huge. They're they're bonkers huge. Um, yeah, but you know, strangely, they're not super big on Twitch yet. Uh, they do get a hundred or so to 300 viewers, I think regularly. But I mean, when you look at critical role, that's got 60,000 concurrent average viewers. It's, it's, it's wild, but glass cannon has a huge amount of podcast listeners. Um, just mind boggling, probably way more than critical role has viewers. Uh, to be perfectly honest, but uh, yeah, they don't get nearly the the press that Critical Role does. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, again, reach out to me if you want to talk more about this stuff. I am more than happy. I'm very transparent about those things. Uh, obviously, uh, I value my time. I'm going to value your time. Um, so when you reach out to me, Think about that. Uh, I, I generally, I'm not. I'm not going to just chat. <laughs> but if you have a question, uh, I'm happy to answer. 
um, as as uh, as well as I can. So uh, that's about it. Um, yeah, thank you all again so much, and uh, until next time, talk to you soon. Bye.